Hello, fellow book lovers, readers, and writers. I am Maddie Dowerpool, and I write the Anne Kinnear suspense novels and suspense shorts and the Lizzie Ballard thrillers. And I also write, speak, and consult on the writing craft and the publishing voyage, and I share what I learn on the Indie Author Podcast. And you can find out more about me at maddiedowerpool.com and at theindieauthor.com. And this is my video series, What I Learned, where I ask authors two questions related to their latest book. What did they learn from the book that they'd like to share with their fellow authors? And what did they learn from the book that they'd like to share with their fellow readers? And I am here today with J.W. Judge. Hey, Jeremy, how are you doing? Hey, I am doing great. Thanks. To give our viewers a little bit of background on you, J.W. Judge is a lawyer by day and a writer in the wee morning hours. And in fact, he's written a book about how to write your novel one day at a time for busy people with aspirations of writing a novel. And he co-hosts the podcast, The Right Approach, W-R-I-T-E, The Right Approach, with author Barbara Hinsky. He is also the author of The Zoberry Chronicles, and his latest book, Casual Business with Fairies, is launching in May 2023. And so I'm asking Jeremy the two What I Learned questions for Casual Business with Fairies, starting with, what did you learn from your latest book that you'd like to share with your fellow authors? So this was a very difficult question to narrow down because I felt like I could probably talk about this particular question for a couple of hours pretty easily. But I will start with the catalyst for this particular idea, because I think that for all of my books, the source of inspiration for the book has been so very different. But for this one particularly, I am part of a community of lawyers, an online chat group with lawyers. And there is a channel where I guess most of us in the channel are parents. It's a parent's channel. Talk about all sorts of things about our, you know, raising children. As a part of that conversation one day, there was talk about the tooth fairy and what does everybody do with the tooth fairy? And so some background about me, I am like the most uh, waspy Southerner, you know, that, that you could ever meet. You know, I, I was brought up. Baptist. I'm a deacon in a Baptist church and, you know, so white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, that that's me. Uh, one of the parents there is from, she is in Seattle. She is married to a transgender person and, you know, they have a polyamorous relationships. She's Wiccan. Like we couldn't be more different, you know, from all of the outside things that you could look at these two people and say, <laughs> these these are not similar people. And so when talking about what to do with the Tooth Fairy, she responded, we don't do casual business with fairies. Nice. And was very serious, like believes in fairies and fairy things. And like, we don't mess around with fairies and play games. And so that drew a lot of questions and, you know, just conversation. But that phrase just stuck in my head. And at the time, I was in the middle of writing my third novel. And so I didn't do anything with it other than, I think at the time, I didn't do anything with it at all. Because I didn't have anything to do with it. But it just stuck in there. Like, we don't do casual business with fairies. Just lodged itself in my brain and snuggled in and wouldn't let go. And so I finished that, that third novel which completed a trilogy I was working on. And then I uh, put together a, the nonfiction book you mentioned, write your novel one day at a time. And I had some ideas about what the next novel would be that I would write. And they just weren't working out. But I still had this one dead gum phrase just stuck there with no premise, no story, nothing. Other than this. And so, you know, that just kind of led to this question about, okay, let's think about this a minute. And I came up with the premise of what if the tooth fairy were evil and had really bad intentions with all these teeth that she's been collecting since people have believed in the tooth fairy for about a hundred years years or so, or if not believed, but at least it's been a cultural thing. Yeah. And, you know, there's this in fairy lore 
telling a fairy your name has power. There is power in a name. So how much more power is in like a part of you, a tooth that came out of you and what could they do with it? And so it was super weird and telling, even though my first three novels were, are urban fantasy, you know, dark fantasy novels, writing a book about an evil tooth fairy still felt kind of weird, but it just, it was a lot of fun and I didn't know where it was going to go. It was very, a, an entirely different writing experience for me, but that it just came from a line in a conversation that just stuck. And so it was a really unique for me source of inspiration. I really like that idea about the power of giving your, a piece of yourself to a fairy, because if you put that spin on it, it's super creepy, especially a tooth. Like, yeah, yeah, all and, sorts of you know, possibilities that's not, there. It's not something I read about generally. Like everything I, I know about fairies now is something I had to research for this book. And so it wasn't a natural fit. I did fit it within the universe and the same kinds of magic as existed in the three other books. And there ended up being a crossover character. I interviewed Kevin Tumlinson for my podcast, and he talked about crossing over character between series as a way of driving readers from one series to another and being a good business decision. And I was writing this novel at the time and intentionally did a crossover with not one of the main characters, but a character exists in those first three books and brought him into this one. And it's strange. And telling people about it was, you get curious reactions like, okay, so you're the kind of person who thinks about evil fairies and what would happen. Like, yeah, I kind of guess I am. That's so cool. I have a couple of like, I think probably kind of secretive crossover characters between my Aunt Kinnear and Lizzie Ballard books, but there are still Months, if not years ago, I put out a challenge saying there are two unnamed characters in a Lizzie Ballard book that are from the Anne Kinnear world. And if you identify them, you get a mug. And that mug is still, it's still up for grabs. So if anybody knows <laughs> who I'm talking about, get in touch with me and there's a mug in it for you. But I, I do like that idea. And I think probably the, the more major the character, the more the opportunity for crossover because the more invested the readers are yeah, in that character. So any other lessons that you'd like to share with your fellow authors based on casual business with fairies? So this was the first standalone book I wrote. The other, the first three novels, part of those, the very chronicles were all written in a third person, free and direct style. They just felt comfortable. I needed multiple viewpoints in all of those. And so it fit what I was writing for that. But this book, I wrote in a first person perspective, which was new and interesting for me. And I'd had a lot of fun changing that up and, you know, just keeping that in a lot of ways. It, and the character was, is a, an insurance coverage lawyer. And I am a lawyer, but I hadn't written about a lawyer before. And so there are a lot of his stories and anecdotes that are mine. And I had considered writing this memoir uh, several years ago about some events in my life. And I was like, you know what? That's just not super exciting. It didn't come together, but I was able to incorporate some of those stories that I would have included there into this in a way that was very natural to the story and brought me into it and kept it personal. And so that was really an interesting thing to do because this novel was so much closer to who I am than anything else I had written. But another thing I had to do that was very difficult was him being an insurance coverage lawyer matters. And insurance coverage questions are all about contracts and what's written in it and what's included and what's excluded. And I needed to establish his expertise without killing everybody with this is horrible insurance stuff and nobody cares because the contract stuff is going to matter later on. And so there is a chapter in this book that establishes his expertise that I rewrote and got feedback from, from multiple lawyers who are fantasy people several times and rewrote it. I don't know more than anything else I've ever written 
because I had, it was just terribly difficult to establish that without it sounding like you're in a continuing legal education seminar. And I had to keep going back and making it more personal and cutting out jargon. And so that was really difficult thing to do over and over and over. I guess another thing that I did in this book that I'd never had to do before, um, because I usually follow a framework pretty closely is I ended up cutting out one or two chapters out of this at the beginning of the book that ultimately I decided didn't serve the story. And I had never done that before. And I thought it would be a difficult thing to do, but knowing that this is the right thing for the story and moves things into the story quicker, it was actually pretty easy to do. Like I thought I would fret over that, but I didn't. I like when I can um, tie in comments with podcast episodes because there was just a recent podcast episode with John Gaspard. I think it was 180. And one of the tips he was sharing, it was top six lessons that novelists can learn from the movies. And one of them was arrive late, leave early. And so I think that example of just dropping a couple of chapters at the beginning is a good example of that. Yeah. I mean, it, it was, I still think that the content of those chapters was interesting and fun, but it didn't serve the story and taking it out. Let us get to that inciting incident and that beginning hook quicker. And like, so that was the right thing to do. Yeah. And how about the second question for what I learned? What did you learn from casual business with fairies that you'd like to share with your fellow readers? This was, I thought about this a lot. Knowing this <laughs> this question is the was hardest coming. one for everybody. It's <laughs> such a hard question. But I think for me, so much of this book was about the characters. And I, unlike the other books that I've written, especially books two and three, where I already knew most of the characters, I didn't know who any of these characters were going to be when I started writing it and grew to just really enjoy and love these characters. And something, I mean, for me as a reader, I really need to engage with a character. Like I don't read things that are just super plot heavy and there's not a lot of character. I, I want to know the character. I want to get engaged with them. And so that for me was a really central focus of this book. I don't go into a lot of backstory. It's all just in the moment and learning who these people are and how they're moving through this universe and these strange circumstances. And one of the things that I think is difficult for people who are not writers to appreciate is how surprising characters can be when you are writing them. And I had more surprises while writing this book about either things that characters did, which probably sounds nuts since I'm the one, you know, like making the choices, even though sometimes it doesn't feel that way. I'm just writing. <laughs> what these people are doing. And it happens to be coming through my hands onto the screen, but also people that came back into the story that I didn't necessarily anticipate doing that or became much more significant characters than I anticipated them being like, just the entire story was one surprise after another. And it was just, I think that's part of why it was so endearing to me. But that said, this is something I interviewed David Ellis about, who's a thriller writer of like, do you have a hard time doing terrible things to your characters? And he was like, immediately, no. And he was just, no. And <laughs> I'm the same way. Like, as much as I liked these people, there were some really atrocious things that happened in this story and I didn't have any qualms about it. So for whatever that says about me, um, this is a story that a lot of interesting and curious things happen, but it is certainly about the characters. Yeah, I'm working on the fourth Lizzie Ballard book and I'm really wrestling with this one of the one of the characters who has appeared in previous books need to die or, or live. And it's it's a tough question. I am struggling with it. Yeah. And I guess it's been that way from book one. Like <laughs> my first novel was Vulcan Rising and I still have a friend who's mad about what I did toward the end of that book to one of the characters. I'm like, look, it wasn't my choice. It had to be done. And I stand by it. And, you know, it doesn't matter how much I like the character. Like, if if the story is served by something terrible happening, then that's what's going to happen. If they got to go, they got to go. That's right. No doubt. Well, Jeremy, that was so interesting. Thank you so much for stopping by to share the lessons you learned from your book. Please 
let the viewers know where they can go to find out more about you and casual business with fairies online. Sure. So my website is jwjudge.com and you can order casual business with fairies anywhere that you like to buy your books online. It's available to libraries. And so if your library doesn't have an electronic copy or a hard copy, you can request it. They can obtain it. So anywhere you like to get your books, you should be able to find it. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you.